Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in today's video we're going to focus on the super moon. Something that you may have heard of from the media and from the news sources that you might listen to and something that you might think is important, but really it's not. You're going to find out why in this video. Welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So first and foremost, we're going to do a bit of science and I'm going to explain to you what Supermoon actually is and why it's actually not a big deal. A lot of news outlets, inc including some of the biggest ones that I, I read actually, including the, you know, websites like space.com and um, Universe Today and um, even NASA website actually have been making a big claim about the Supermoon being the biggest moon ever since like 1948 or something. And it just kind of made me actually uh, really shocked because those claims are kind of bogus and they're actually kind of incorrect. So here's actually why. I'm going to show you uh, the moon's orbit. This is this is moon orbiting around Earth. And basically, um, if you know anything about orbits, um, all orbits, without exception, are usually elliptical. They're not circular. Uh, so this is not actually a circle. This is a, something called ellipse, or you can also refer to it as an oval. Um, a very eccentric orbit would be like this. This is a very eccentric orbit with a lot of, I guess you can call it ovality or ellip ellipsicity, if that's a word. I don't think it is. But basically, it's a very, very highly elliptical orbit uh, that you can kind of display by clicking this button right here. Moon doesn't have this elliptical orbit. Moon's uh, ellip um, eccentricity is only about 0 0.06 or about 6%. So it actually looks like this. It looks like almost like a circle, but there's still a bit of uh, eccentricity to it. What this means is that every once in a while, specifically once a month or once every 28 days, a moon actually is uh, either at the closest to the Earth or at the farthest. When it comes to space sciences, we refer to these two points as perigee or periapsis and apogee or apoapsis. So I'm going to show it to you using the graph right here under motion. This is a really uh, beautiful graph located right here, distance to host. So right about now, we're going to be at the closest distance, at the perigee, and you're going to see it hit that point as soon as we reach this location right here. So there, there's the lowest or the closest location. That's the perigee. Right now, it's going to go to the farthest location known as apogee. So when it's at the closest, the moon is obviously a little bit slightly bigger in terms of size, uh, in terms of uh, how it looks like from Earth, but not by much. As a matter of fact, here's a picture demonstrating how insignificant that difference is. Right here, it's going to be at the farthest, so it's going to be, it's going to look a little bit farther away. In terms of brightness, it's a little bit brighter here, a little bit darker here. Now, this happens every single month. It's not a big deal. It actually happens every single month, and every single month we can actually experience slightly higher tides um, when it's at this point, slightly lower tides when it's at this point. So this kind of occurs without really uh, us witnessing it. But what we do witness is, of course, what the moon looks like. And so once in a while, and specifically here we're talking about about once every year, uh, what happens is that the uh, moon's periapsis or the moon's perigee actually corresponds to um, the full moon. Basically, right at, let me just slow down this a little bit, right at this point right here, the moon can also become full moon. It's not right now, but if it was a full moon, if it basically looked like this, and also this was the perigee or periapsis, the closest location to our planet Earth, it would look basically very, very bright and I guess very, very large. Not something that you would witness though, not something that you can easily tell apart unless you actually stare at the moon every single day. The difference is very insignificant. It's basically like saying this versus this right here. So I actually decided to place two moons side by side just so you can see the difference. So in reality, this moon is slightly smaller than this moon, specifically by about five to seven percent. Now, so this would be the normal full moon and this would be the super moon. Can you tell the difference? Because I definitely can't, but they are different. If you look at their size here, this is slightly smaller than this. Uh, this is actually not the uh, side of the moon that you're familiar with. You're probably more familiar with the other side, but I decided not to show you the other side just so you can actually see it from, from this other, the dark side of the moon location as well. This is actually what the other side looks like. So, but yeah, these, these are basically the equivalent of the normal moon and the super moon. So basically, that, there's no big difference there. 
But one of the other reasons I actually wanted to make this video is because there is so many different uh, interesting... Oh no, oh no, they're collapsing. No, that's not what I wanted to do, but you know what, why not? Uh, let's watch these beautiful explosions. Yeah, there's a lot of different superstition associated with this uh, supermoon, and specifically here, a lot of people always associate disasters and horrible uh, things in life with the supermoon. Specifically, very recently, there was a very large earthquake in New Zealand, and it just so happens that it happened within two days of the supermoon. Um, a few years ago, there was um, a tsunami in Japan that also sort of corresponded to about two weeks within the supermoon. And uh, even the uh, other big earthquakes and big disasters, like the Indonesian tsunami, also were within like a month period of the supermoon. Now, is it a coincidence? Yes, it is. It's actually a coincidence. And the reason for that is because, like I said before, supermoons occur once a year. The chance of a disaster occurring in, in the same sort of time frame is very, very, very high. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of horrible disasters that happen when it's not a supermoon. Let's actually collide another one for fun. Uh, no, not an orbit. Just stand right there. Launch. Launch. There we go. Explosions. Awesome. Now that's a supermoon. Now I'm going to be making a very, very large supermoon. Because it's basically going to be a humongous moon consisting of all of the other moons. Uh, but yeah, so a lot of the disasters, a lot of the superstition associated with the supermoon are just that. They're just superstitions. There's absolutely no relation between them. Once in a while you'll have a disaster that corresponds to the supermoon, but most of them don't. And the thing is, even this supermoon we just had, uh, it is not the largest possible um, moon that you can observe. As a matter of fact, it's approximately 30 minutes away from being the brightest possible supermoon, which we actually will not probably see for a very long time. So in other words, to uh, to have the largest possible, the super super ultra moon, you would have to have the full moon occur exactly at the moment when the moon is at, at its periapsis or perigee, which is actually almost impossible and also not very significant at all. It doesn't change anything. It definitely doesn't change the tides. It doesn't change any sort of conditions on Earth because Earth experiences these tides whether it is full moon or not. But another unusual fact about the supermoons is that um, moons also get a bit of an effect from the sun. Let's actually go to the normal simulation here, uh, the solar system simulation, or maybe not this one, maybe the one with solar system with all of the major moons. So right here, if we zoom into Earth, we'll see that obviously Earth has moon orbiting around it, uh, but every uh, winter, when it's December, Earth is actually closest to the sun. And because it's closest to the sun, the moon also experiences a little bit more of a gravitational pull from the sun. So when the moon is at, not this location, but the opposite location, when the moon is right here in December, it is actually slightly closer to Earth. And because of this, if the supermoon does actually, or I guess if there is actually a full moon in November, December or January, it will actually look slightly larger in the sky because it's going to be pulled slightly closer to the Earth. And also because it's cold in the winter, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, the skies are usually clearer, so the moon will actually appear even brighter than usual. So there's a lot of combination of things that make moon so, so large in the sky. First is, of course, uh, the atmospheric composition and or the atmosphere itself. Uh, so if there's no haze, if there's no uh, pollution in the air, the moon will appear very, very bright. And the other thing is, of course, the effects of the sun on the moon, which are also kind of minute, but are there and definitely affect the moon slightly in December. But one thing about the supermoon that it doesn't actually do is it doesn't actually affect tides. Tides are not affected by the brightness of the moon. As a matter of fact, nothing is really affected by the brightness of the moon on Earth. Except for, of course, our psyche. We have a lot of uh, psychological uh, fears or psychological ideas based on the full moon. So people are affected by the moon, but all of it is really psychosomatic. It's basically all in your head. Uh, the interesting thing about the um, super moons is that they're basically getting smaller and smaller practically every year, but very, very unnoticeably so because moon is actually slowly drifting away from Earth. In a billion year, years or so, um, moon is actually going to be much farther away from Earth, and so the supermoons and also these um, moon, lunar eclipses will actually become a lot less prominent and a lot less large in the sky. So currently the moon is actually relatively large, but in a billion years it's going to be much smaller in the sky. But I guess the, the biggest uh, misconception about the supermoons is, of course, the fact that they actually do happen every single year. Um, as a matter of fact, they're very, very likely to happen near the end of the year, and they're very, very likely to happen whenever there is a full moon and whenever the moon is relatively close to the closest location around um, in its orbit around Earth. 
which in this case is kind of hard to see, but it's basically whenever the moon is the closest to Earth. But you can see its periapsis is constantly changing because it's receiving uh, pulls from, uh, from the sun and possibly from other objects as well. And one of the last things I wanted to mention is the actual name for the supermoon or the scientific name for the supermoon. So the word supermoon is actually really, really recent. It's sort of actually from astrology, which is why I don't really like using it, because it's kind of uh, <clears throat> bogus. It's not real. It's not true. Uh, the actual word for this particular phenomenon is the perigee syzygy of Earth, Moon, Sun system. Basically, it's when you have this kind of a coincidental alignment of the perigee or the closest location of Earth and, and Moon and um, with combination of a full moon, which is usually caused by the fact that the moon is on the opposite side of Earth and is completely eliminated by the sun. So basically right around here, that would be the location where you get the full moon. So it's, you can see like there's an alignment between these three objects. You kind of can't see anymore, but moon, Earth to sun will actually be a straight line. So this is why we call this a syzygy. And so if the moon is actually the closest to the Earth, this is when you'll get these uh, sort of full moon effects that look very, very large from our planet, or at least appear large, but are not very noticeable. And actually, if the moon is in the same location, but this happens to be the apogee or the farthest uh, distance from Earth, we call this micromoon, which is also not a really common term, but it does exist. But if you're really interested in this phenomenon and you actually want to witness the biggest possible supermoon ever, 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 it's going to occur on December 6th of 2052. So basically, uh, something like 36 years from when I'm actually making this video. And this is going to be the biggest uh, syzygy ever. It's going to be when the moon is basically practically at its periapsis and the sun is eliminating the moon and obviously the Earth is in the middle. And this will be the probably the largest supermoon we'll witness for the next few hundred years. But other than that, there's really nothing special about this phenomenon. As a matter of fact, I never even considered it to be that big of a deal until suddenly the media decided to portray it as something really, really cool. Which I think it really isn't, because you know what? We actually see the moon every single day, but how many times do we look at it and go, wow, this is pretty awesome? Not very many times. And I'm kind of happy that the media does portray uh, Supermoon as kind of cool, but chances are most people will forget that it exists uh, after today, which is very unfortunate because I do love the moon and I talk about it and I try to love it every single day. Anyway, so that's all I wanted to talk about in this video. And let's go back to the moon and possibly invite some other objects to collide with it before we finish this video. Like for example, Mercury. No, that's too big, that's too big. Let's instead just place a bunch of other moons from other planets around it and see how they all behave and what, what happens if we actually put a bunch of them together and then decide to release the timer and make this all go havoc. So here we go. Oh, look at that. They're actually sort of orbiting, but not for long. Okay, then. Interesting. Look at that. That, that is a super moon right there. This right there is the biggest moon imaginable. The super ultra moon. I'm going to name it that. The super moon, because it's basically a combination of all moons together, and it's so hot that it's actually smoking and evaporating a lot of the materials. And Titan needs to come back and join it. I'm going to actually add Titan manually by launching it directly at my super moon. There we go. And anyway, so thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video and if you learned something from it, don't forget to subscribe, share this video with your friends, and possibly consider supporting this channel on Patreon as well, because it does help me get better equipment. I'll see you guys in the next video, and we're going to talk about something else, scientific, space-related, math-related, or maybe just play a video game. See you later, game you later, and as always, bye-bye. And wouldn't it be awesome if this was our super moon, if we actually stood on our planet Earth to look into the skies and saw that, now that would be terrifying. That I would definitely consider to be a bad omen. Possibly hide under a rock and never come out. Not sure if that would help me though. See you later guys. Bye bye.